So good morning, and sorry we're late getting started, but I'm Don Day, and I'm a facilitator of a group of local interfaith organizations that uh, have been doing book studies over the last several years, and we've taken several uh, pilgrimages, civil rights pilgrimages. It was our belief that uh, the uh, critical race theory needs a larger audience, and that's why we planned this event. We'd like to uh, thank Rockbridge Christian uh, hosting us today. A uh, few announcements uh, for those in person. You should have a pen and a note card. If you uh, would like to submit it anonymously, you can do that. or. For those of you here, you can answer, uh, ask questions uh, in person. Uh, at the end of the first hour, we will uh, open it up to questions and answers. For those from home, you can submit questions uh, through chat, and those questions will be relayed to a team member uh, here to read out loud. If we don't get all the questions answered today, we do have a follow-up session scheduled on January 8th from 10 o'clock at Broadway. So now we'll get started. I want to introduce our moderator for this morning, Dr. Chris Lawrence. She founded the Heart Space Clinic, a local nonprofit dedicated to assisting children and adults with trauma-informed training, consulting, and direct services. So she's going to start us off with the next guys. We'll uh, start in with our panel. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Don, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, I'm going to start with just a little exercise to help everybody kind of settle in. So if you wouldn't mind, if you're multitasking, um, just put that aside for just a minute. Um, if you're at home, you can participate in this as well. So I want everyone to just start with looking around the space. So we're in a big, beautiful hall, and just let your eyes just take in the space that we're in. Maybe find something that's pleasant to look at, and pay particular attention to the windows and the doors and the space where you can go if you want to Take a break. And then for just a moment, just feel your feet on the ground. Everybody shifts from sitting <laughs> cross-legged. And just feel your feet on the ground and almost feel as if gravity is your feet towards the earth. And notice how quiet. Got. And just take a minute to just see how that feels in your body. To just feel your feet on the ground and the gravity holding you in place. And if anything today or this morning feels overwhelming, just put your feet on the ground and think about your feet. It'll help you to just get more centered and less out in your head. So thank you for letting me do that. I'm going to start with a few ground rules. And as I read them, it sort of reminded me of ground rules in kindergarten. Things don't really change as we grow up. So the first one of one another and each other's opinions. No cheering or applause in between questions and answers. We want to move through things fairly quickly. No heckling. Um, be additive. So if someone has asked a question um, and you have a question that's pretty similar, perhaps just leave that for another day so that we can get through a lot of different questions today. Ask questions, no statements. So we're here because we have an expert panel who has um, given us their time and we would like to use that time well. So we're asking questions of them. And then just remember that everyone's experience is valid, that we all have different life histories and life experiences, and that we're here to hear about that, but not necessarily make judgments or agree or disagree. 
All right, thank you. I'd like to give each of our panel members a moment to introduce themselves. And then I have a series of questions that we're gonna pose to individual um, members or the group, the panel as a whole. So, would you like to start? Sure. Um, can you all hear me? Okay. My name is Heather Fleming. I am the uh, founder and director of In Purpose Educational Services, which is a, a 501c3 nonprofit that does equity, um, um, diversity, and inclusion training uh, in my community and, and around the country, actually, now. And then, um, once all of the CRT, anti-CRT stuff started coming up, I founded the Missouri Equity Education Partnership as well. And what we're doing is that we're working uh, throughout the state of Missouri in order to fight back against the narrative um, and some of the laws that have been introduced in order to um, basically ban equity education in our, um, in our curriculums, our schools, and, and all of our realms of influence. I'm also the author of uh, My Black Friend Says, Lessons in Equity, Inclusion, and Cultural Competency. And um, more than that, I'm a mom of three wonderful children. My daughter's back there. She's probably going to be embarrassed. Um, three wonderful children plus two bonus children. And so I'm happy, very happy to be here with each of you. Thank you, Heather. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is David Mitchell. Typically, when I would say good morning in my class, it would be a response. <laughs> I'm not going to hold y'all to it this morning, but we're going to get to that later. Good morning, Dr. Mitchell. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, that's sort of one of those things. Um, uh, I am, uh, my name is David Mitchell. I am the Ruth L. Halston Professor of Law and the co-director of the Michael A. Middleton Center for Race, Citizenship, and Justice at the University of Missouri. Um, I have been uh, in this town now on this faculty for the last 16 years. Previous to that, I was at the University of Colorado at Boulder in their sociology department. Uh, and before that, actually, I was a high school teacher in New York City at my alma mater, which is an all boys private school that I went through for 12 years, where I taught American history survey. I taught a class on South African history, and I taught a <coughs> class called Rebellions, Revolutions, and Riots, comparing black protest in the Caribbean and the United States. Um, I have two children in the Columbia eighth grader and an eighth grader. Um, my spouse is also an academic. We are an interracial, interfaith family. Um, my children are named after Harlem Renaissance authors. <laughs> and quite simply, I, I, this discussion I think is incredibly important. I'm sort of looking forward to it. Um, I am a, a critical race theorist. I am a scholar who uses it in his work. Uh, my scholarship is on ex-offenders or formerly incarcerated, excuse me, formerly incarcerated, uh, returning home, uh, re-entry and reintegration, as well as felon disenfranchisement and the impact of collateral consequences on individuals uh, who return to our society after periods of incarceration or after conviction. Thank you. Ruby? Good morning, everybody. My name is Ruby Bailey. I am a grandma of three here in the Columbia Public School District. Uh, well, two of the three are in the Columbia Public School District. I am a 30-year journalist um, and have spent time in Detroit, which is where I'm from originally. Washington, D.C. Uh, was a national correspondent, an international correspondent embedded in Iraq. Uh, uh, worked in digital, worked in California and Sacramento as a digital editor. Um, and then came here to Mizzou, where I was the executive editor of the Columbia Missourian and an endowed chair for journalism uh, at the University of Missouri, and am now the opinion and public engagement editor at the Indianapolis Star. I've spent most of my career uh, writing or teaching um, about issues involving social justice, even though we didn't necessarily call it that then as, as we call it that now. Uh, but I spent most of my, t my, my teaching and my reporting career writing about issues um, about disenfranchised folks and doing what we now call amplifying those voices um, within media outlets across the country, as well as my work at Mizzou, where I taught the only race culture uh, class specific to reporting in a time of race mm -hmm. class and culture for J school students. And I'm so glad to be here. Great. Because that you. means I don't have to wreck leaves. <laughs> so just talk all you want. <laughs> I, would, I would just like to add that I'm not intimidated at all. <laughs> but, oh, I am. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to stay down here. <laughs> like, wow. I am. <laughs> right? 
Okay, we're going to start with a question for Dr. Mitchell. Can you give us a general definition of critical race theory and a little bit about why we're all here? Sure, I can try. Because um, <laughs> quite honestly, I think asking an academic um, to discuss a theoretical uh, evolving mm -hmm. is, is kind of like sort of saying, can you sort of test the wind and figure out where it's, which direction it's blowing and how it's moving? Um, it evolves, it changes with time, it is not static. And so I think that's the first thing to actually recognize, right? That the proponents of the theoretical framework in 1970, when they created it, it has moved since then and it has changed and it has broadened and it has given birth to other theoretical movements. So I'll start with that. Um, the current conversation around critical race theory is filled with a great deal of misinformation and mischaracterization and a misunderstanding of what it is. Um, many have been fed false propaganda regarding their talking points uh, about CRT uh, to deflect and to cast, quite honestly, its proponents as fomenters of dissension, when that is not the case. Um, the onslaught with respect to news and media around CRT came following um, in its most vociferous form following January 6th, uh, and quite honestly, following the election that we just recently had in 2020. Um, and that was the sort of response, that individuals who were discussing CRT were not patriots where others were, and that we were creating a divided nation. Quite honestly, what has happened is that uh, critical race theory has been unduly and erroneously conflated with diversity, equity, and inclusion training. It is not the same, yet people have identified one of the same. Um, that is a problem. The attack on critical race theory um, was not born this year. It's been a slow boil, quite frankly. Um, when I was teaching at school in New York City, I was thinking about the evolution with respect to these issues. We began with saying that we needed representation in curriculum, we needed representation in certain spaces, and we began with things like days and heroes. Let's talk about these other groups that we have not talked about as things to add on to the end of the curriculum when we have time and not including them in the curriculum. And so we began this path, right, to diversity. And then we moved to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Well, during that time frame, critical race theory had been created in law schools by law professors, not K through 12 educators, not high schools, those framing, in that framing of a conversation. Civil rights lawyers got together in the 1970s and 1980s to talk about what they felt was a stalled civil rights movement and to address the flaws in where we were in this process. So it is a dynamic and eclectic growing movement in the law. It has moved to other academic disciplines at the graduate and professional school level, not at the high school level. And if it is involved in undergraduate education, it is with respect to classes that look at race in the systemic, if you will, disciplines that address issues around education, criminal justice, um, and other sort of related fields, sociology, social work, places where you have systems and institutions that need to be interrogated and investigated with respect to systemic issues around racism. So what we see is it begins in 1970s with uh, some, some incredibly esteemed individuals such as Derek Bell and Alan Freeman. They begin this process, and they were distressed, quite honestly, with the slow pace of racial reform that was occurring in the United States. Other proponents of the theory, I was currently the executive of the American Policy Forum, um, Marie Matsuda, Charles Lawrence, right, Richard Delgado, um, these, Gene Stefanik, his wife, these are individuals who began this movement that the civil rights movement gains that had been achieved were being rolled back. We've seen some of this rollback already. Civil rights laws with respect to Shelby versus Holder, uh, removing the pre-clearance requirement for voting rights. That is one that's very nice that we needed a new approach to study and understand what were the subtle and deeply entrenched varieties of racism. Critical race theory draws its, if you will, from a variety of different places. It draws it from critical legal studies, which talks about legal indeterminacy that there's not one correct outcome with a, with, a, with, a, with a legal case, that judges sit in judgment, they're not umpires, they don't call balls and strikes. They have primary and secondary socialization, they have biases, legal indeterminacy means you look back in the past to precedential cases and they will help you determine the future based upon how you read those cases. There is no objective outcome in a legal case because it is influenced by how the arguments are made and the laws that are used, and the laws that are used are created by individuals and humans who are fundamentally flawed and injected with their own particular biases. 
it draw also its roots, its intellectual roots from radical feminism, right? No one would look at our country and say that the, the genders have been equal since its founding. That would be a ridiculous statement to say, particularly when once upon a time women were considered property in their parents' household and in their husband's household. It also draws its intellectual roots from con continental and social, uh, continental social and political philosophy from the European continent. But it also takes its more intellectual roots from American civil rights and nationalist movements in the United States from the work of Dr. King, Rosa Parks, Du Bois, and Cesar Chavez, as well as the more nationalist forms of Malcolm X and the Black Panthers. Right? I know once we invoke those names, often folks get very scared. Right? The idea is, oh my goodness, you're talking about individuals who engage in separatism or segregation when actually they were talking humans and, uh, for African Americans. This begins in 1989, 1970, 1989, and it continues forward. And I will give the, the couple tenets, and then I will let's go to other, other questions, some examples. The tenets around critical race theory are as follows. That racism in the United States, in America, is normal. It is not an aberration. It is not an abnormality. It is embedded. It is part of the DNA of this nation. It is ingrained and it appears to be ordinary and, to, and natural to persons in American culture. It is so much a part of who we are, the fabric of who we are, that we don't even see it at times. That is how much of a part of the daily life that it exists. Formal equal opportunity, rules and laws that insist on treating African Americans and whites alike can only address the most extreme and shocking forms of injustice. We have removed de jure segregation. No longer are you told that you officially and legally can't live in a particular area. In our own Columbia, we have an area in town that was demolished, that was removed, where all black folks were required to live. It no longer exists, right? We have moved from black, we have created black personhood when folks, when African Americans were once upon a time property. That's the, the, however, it does not do so well with the usual forms of racism that might exist that people of color face. The current tsunami of the Karen events around the country is one example. Right? Buying coffee while black, bird watching while black, selling water while black. Anything dot, 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 while black has become the name Karen, quite frankly, because we have maligned a name to call out this particular ridiculousness. And yet that is the subtle forms that exist. That is what we do not see. Driving really profiled, regardless of who you are or the car you're driving. As I tell my students repeatedly, I have a JD and a PhD, and when I leave Halston Hall on the University of Missouri campus, I am in a black man in America. It's not tattooed on my forehead, the degrees I hold, or who I am. That is not as what is foreseen. That becomes, this is the issue that critical race theory seeks to address. Secondly, race is not biologically constructed. It is a social construction of race based upon primary, secondary socialization, how we perceive other groups, the intake of information, how individual groups and groups are presented through us, through images in the media and what we do. That becomes a part of how we socially construct racial identity in the United States. Derek Bell also developed the third piece, the core tenet is interest convergence, right? This concept holds that white elites will tolerate or encourage racial advances for blacks only when such advances also promote white self-interest. Case in point, the big one, affirmative action. Affirmative action was not some moral coming to Jesus moment where folks said, oh, we've done this group wrong. No, it was, guess what? Oh, we will use affirmative action and it will benefit. And primarily it was to white women in this context. All right, so it wasn't just African-Americans who were given this opportunity and not an opportunity, right? Who were given access, right? That's the difference. And of course we have framed it and it has been framed at least after affirmative action, this notion that somehow this group is getting an advantage. We'll talk about some of the examples on critical race theory of the lack of advantages there and how we have equalized the playing field. Recognition number four, it recognizes and acknowledges intersectionality. That race alone is not the singular avenue or lens by which we view the world. It is critical race theory, but we recognize the fact is, I have two black women on my sides. Are you gonna just say that they're black? No, you're not. You're also gonna look at their gender. Right? That is the intersectionality that exists here. If I were to tell you more about my own personal background, it would be I've had parents who were sharecroppers, right? 
I am now solidly in the middle class, even though I never believe it, as my wife says, you are. But because of that particular economic background, that is a part of my identity. That I look at individuals through this lens, we are looking not just at race, but at gender, at socioeconomic status, at gender identity, at sexual orientation, right? These are all the intersectional pieces that we view and that are impacted when we talk about this sort of framework and systemic issues. Unique voice, that people of color have a unique voice that has long been silenced. When I was teaching in the high school, right, we talked about what is the, what is the English canon for literature, which meant you didn't read Toni Morrison because that was not a part of what was the prescribed and classical doctrine of what needed to be literature, right? And so now we're recognizing an entire framing of the narrative, of the conversations. And now we seem to be going backwards trying to ban books that in effect have those voices that have now been included in the curriculums. CRT folks, number six, CRT folks question whether civil rights is actually designed to benefit folks of color, quite frankly. We've created, we're using a framework, a legal framework that is one that is flawed, that is biased. But we use that pathway for those in them who believes that the law can be used as a tool to do such. But if you look at some of the great advances in the legal system in that regard. Brown versus Board of Education, we herald a day that we struck down educational segregation in theory, not in practice. The court struck it down, and what did the court do? It didn't give any direction. Speed segregate. And what it also did was it relinquished and allowed us to get rid of an entire cadre of professional teachers who actually gave a great deal of concern for their pushing for integration. And we created then a framework of a lower educational standards in many places as a result. Uh, lastly, critical race theory folks, we use biography and autobiography to expose sort of this false necessity and this unintentional irony of civil rights and the scholarship around it. Right? When I write about this, or when others who write about this before this movement, they would never get published in mainstream law review articles. They had to create specialized legal journals to have this voice recognized and acknowledged. This is the critique that we sort of offered. So those are sort of the tenets. That's its founding where it's from. I'm sure folks have other questions. Sure. <laughs> so would you like to give an example? Oh, sure, I can do that too. the next question, and then we'll move on to a question for somebody else. Oh, yes, <laughs> certainly. <laughs> so let's start with one, one that I, I like to start with. I just actually wrote a, an article about or a piece about for another, for another conference. The transmission of black wealth in the United States, or the lack thereof, the inability there. I am a child of sharecropper parents who moved north. My mother then worked in a factory, or not in a factory, in a factory making sunglasses, and then worked for the F.W. Woolworth Company. Not college educated, I'm first generation, right? Which means there was no wealth to pass on. We live paycheck to paycheck, right? I can now pass on wealth to my children, but that's in now, 2021, right? Or when I die, they can get that wealth. Hopefully not anytime soon, right? That is the transmission of wealth. But if you take a look at this piece, if you move back further, this begins, the lack of the ability to transfer wealth begins with places in which we've identified in the United States as places where wealth equity accumulates, and that is housing. Redlining policies that denied or devalued communities of color, that actually valued their houses less, did not give them mortgages, that created fundamentally socially, economically, uh, and poorer areas, poor, poor areas created a framework where those individuals cannot, couldn't pass down equity to their children. They were renting. Their money was continuously going to someone else outside of neighborhoods as a result. So the concomitant piece of that is with depressed social or depressed economic value, and this is the other sort of uh, how CRT explains it is, then you had lower property taxes which meant with lower property taxes, you had less funding for public schools. With less funding for public schools, you had outdated books, you had potential teachers who were not as qualified as others, and you therefore had an educational system that was not actually serving its population. The trajectory, therefore, of access to moving up was denied because of a policy of denying home ownership and redlining, something folks would say is far removed from the end result of the actual success of children. That's the one, what's one example. Second example, and I'll leave with the second example, or criminal justice and sentencing. 
Now, I could just drop the mic on that one and leave it. From, I'm sure most folks are aware of this one, but we'll sort of push a little bit further. The disproportionality of the incarceration of African-American men and women during the war on drugs is a, of, the of how critical race theory would say this is a problem. And one need no, look no further than the following. Crack cocaine and powder cocaine. Pharmacolog the same substance. And yet, the ratio was 100 to 1. 100 grams of powder versus 1 gram of crack got you this sentence. All right? The latter clearly being a drug of individuals who couldn't afford a great deal. You couldn't afford powder cocaine. And as a result, the problem was harsher sentences. Overly hard sense. Also, the second look at critical race theory in criminal justice and sensing in the following manner. We have just removed ourselves from an opioid epidemic. Crack, during, during the crack era, what did we do? We criminalized addiction. What we do now, we medicalized addiction. The response is fundamentally different. Ye time. The lack and the inability to transfer wealth, once again, because we have removed hosts of people from, the, from their families and their economic structure, creating, therefore, this breakdown of family structure deemed to be or what was purported to be a neutral policy around drugs. The last one I'll get because we're talking about the education is the following. Zero tolerance policies in education. Now, just by watching me, I talk with my hands. I get very loud. I get very boisterous. In my family, we just call that Thanksgiving. <laughs> right? Uh, we, it, we get loud in the house. That's how we are. The problem, how this is interp interpreted, interpreted in schools is, if I raise my voice in a class because I'm passionate about something, it's not viewed as me being passionate. It's viewed as me being aggressive. For it becomes now the individual is fearful. And what happens is now I get referred to zero tolerance. Now I get suspended. Now I get expelled. And now I have an educational trajectory that has been those that under zero students of color and disabled students are more likely to be the ones referred, not just through zero tolerance, but then into the juvenile justice system and then creating that track record also going into the system of a punishment, right? And so critical race theory says, let's look at this. Let's look at the disproportionality. It's a lens by which we view the institutions and structures that we have in the United States to say race is a fundamental part of this. Racism is an inherent element that exists there. And in order for us to create truly neutral and objective institutions, we have to interrogate it and be honest with the fact that race is a salient factor in each of these institutions. Thank you. Sure. Yes, you want to add something? Community, we would say, well, you preached it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, I wasn't supposed to be a shout out to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 so, one request for the panelists if you use an acronym, please describe what that is. So, some sure. of us, yeah. Um, so, Heather. Yes. Some say that educational equity policies, equity initiatives, mm -hmm. culture responsive teaching DRT in disguise. Can you explain the differences and similarities? Um, well, here's the thing, is that we, you've seen the discussion, uh, because it's such a thing, what CRT is, and so it's like um, the connection is very tangential. Um, when we are looking at culturally responsive, uh, teaching practices, what we're, what we're doing is we're saying, hey, how do we make sure that we are inclusive of, of um, diverse groups of people that all of our students can see themselves represented in, the, um, in their curriculum? And on that on the additional is that how, what techniques can we really use that make sure that it reaches all kids, or the education reaches all kids? Um, when you were given the examples, I, I could give lots of different examples. I used to teach, um, I forgot to mention, I was an English teacher prior to getting into this work. And I used to teach Romeo and Juliet, right? And so in teaching Romeo and Juliet, what I was able to do is to bring my culture into this piece of literature. So an example that I could give you is that um, 
when Tybalt is angry and he looks and he says, I hate hell. Excuse me, I hate um, the word as I hate hell, all Montagues and thee, have at thee, coward. And I was able to be like, hey, y'all, basically what he's saying is, I don't like you, I don't like your mama, I don't like your daddy, I don't like any of y'all. <laughs> let's fight, let's do this, let's get busy. That was bringing different cultures in, um, and that's what we're trying to do. You have kids that um, they can very well express themselves if they're allowed to use their lexicon um, in doing that. Now, when it comes to an essay, yes, I can go through the essay and say, hey, you need to do this, this, and that. But we also have to acknowledge that people bring in like just a wealth of culture. I had another class where I had a, a student that spoke seven languages. Seven languages. So yes, if he were expressing something to me and it wasn't exactly grammatically um, perfect, guess what? I, I can't express it in any language except English, okay? Um, my Spanish, honestly, is limited to food items. I know how to say taquero. <laughs> so we just get to the point where we have to bring in different experiences and we have to allow all of those experiences to exist in the same space. What has been happening is that, um, and this was a strategy, they took this obscure term. I have been doing equity training for years and the first time I heard CRT, critical race theory, was six months ago, seven, eight months ago, okay? And that's because what they did is they took something that was an obscure academic term and they said, um, let's just put it out there to people and then let, let them assign meaning to it. And so that's what's been happening. People have been going through and assigning their own meaning to it. And it, it comes out that whatever ends up being equity education, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, they have said that CRT and it's bad. And I would challenge each of you to switch that narrative. Because as we listen to the tenets of critical race theory, I would like to know which one they have a problem with. Mm -hmm. What is it that you have a problem with? Is it the critical part? Is it the theory part? Or is it the race? What's happened is that we've, we've gotten to the point where now anything that is based in um, you know, theories that discuss race, discuss things that make people uncomfortable, ends up being, um, they try to demonize it. Um, and that's just not right. And the other thing that, that has been attempted is, is to um, say that it's, if we're teaching diversity, equity, inclusion, we cannot possibly be rigorous. That's false. That's false. You all just sat and listened to Dr. Mitchell. I was sitting there like, this is wonderful. I could just listen all day. Are you telling me that's, that wouldn't be a rigorous study in, 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 in thinking critically and a new perspective, new ideas, new ways of thinking? Yeah, of course it would be. And so we still have rigor involved in um, introducing diversity, equity, and inclusion, and in introducing any type of CRT. But I will end with this. Our schools aren't teaching it, okay? To sit and say that our schools are teaching CRT is to say that um, it's the Bolshevik revolution, we're obviously teaching communism. We're not, okay? As a matter of fact, the, the um, legislature, Joint Committee on Education, asked DESE to please do a survey of schools. Over 400 schools, return, school districts in the state of Missouri returned the survey, and would you like to know which, how many actually said that they were teaching anything near CRT? One. One. And again, because of the meaning that's been assigned, we don't even know if it's true CRT. How many school districts had the 1619 project as part of their curriculum? Three. Three. This is. 
And we get to the point where it's like, so why are we doing this? Well, the main reason why we're doing this is because, hey, they have a boogeyman that they can now make a wedge issue because people are scared when it comes to talking about race. And I would challenge you that you shouldn't be. As a matter of fact, in my training, that's the first thing we deal with. How do we not be afraid of this? And so yes, please question that. Which one of these tenets of CRT um, upset you? And why? So, okay, I'm done. Can you explain Desi? Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. That's all right. <laughs> the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Okay. And so as a teacher, um, that's who licensed me, certified me. Um, that's who puts out like curriculum. Um, that's who does a lot of work around education. So all of our licensing, um, a lot of our curriculum information, um, they also handle all of our uh, um, testing, um, et cetera. It's, it's a big agency. Great, thank you, Heather. So we're gonna move on to talking about the 1619 Project. And Heather, we're gonna start with you. Go so take a drink of water. Heather might, <laughs> Heather might need more water, please. There's water here. Oh, there, right there. Okay. Put that on down, all right. Okay, could you describe for us what the 1619 Project is and why it has become part of the discussion on critical race theory? Yeah, so Hannah Nicole Jones, right? Yeah, okay, I was making sure. Um, Journalists spent years and a lot of time researching um, basically 1619 and what has been, oh, look, there you go. visual aids. Visual aids. Um, That's right. <laughs> so 1619 is the year that the first enslaved people were brought um, from Africa. And basically in, on the anniversary, it was 2019 that she released the 1619 Project, a very well-researched, um, we had information about various events. They, she did a lot of analysis on how those events have now impacted um, the, the culture and the people that, that came from enslaved people. Um, did a really good, a lot of journalistic, good journalistic work. Um, there were some historians that had some criticisms of such, some of her conclusions. And so what has happened is those individuals who were against um, again, discussing race, racism, et cetera, they began to take those um, small criticisms and turn it into something that was aimed at discrediting the whole um, project, which they should not have been. You probably, you're a journalist. Um, <laughs> she gets her next question. <laughs> <laughs> she just Good. keeps talking. <laughs> I'm just going to keep learning. Go ahead. <laughs> Well, speaking of Ruby, yes. I have a question for you. Sure. Some claim that portions of the 1619 Project are untrue mm -hmm. and exaggerated. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us how an article like the 1619 Project is formed and what sort of vetting and editing process is involved? Okay. Um, and to answer that question, I'm going to do two things. One is I'm going to refer you to a political article uh, that came out March 6 in 2020. Uh, and it was written by a professor by the name of Leslie Harris. She's a, a history professor, uh, um, and she, is a, she studies African-American pre-Civil War history specifically. I'm going to refer you to that article in part because she was one of the fact checkers on the 1619 Project. Um, and when the New York Times called her with, a, with, with portions of it, she had a concern. And she had a concern regarding um, what she thought were um, liberties that were being taken with the assertion that the um, Revolutionary War was fought in large part over the enslavement of Africans, right? And so um, she, t she warned them not to, to, to phrase it that way, that it was not historically accurate. And I'm gonna just, pardon me while I read to you this one part of what she said, because this is exactly what has happened. Overall, she says, the 1619 Project is a much needed corrective to the blindly celebratory histories that once dominated our understanding of the past. Histories that wrongly suggested racism and slavery were not a central part of US history. 
I was concerned that critics would use the overstated claim, being the overstated claim that the Revolutionary War was fought basically because of slavery, um, when, when that's more of a Civil War issue, right? I was concerned that critics would use the overstated claim to discredit the entire undertaking, and so far that's exactly what has happened. Mm -hmm. It is a fantastic work. She goes on to talk about um, other pieces of the project, um, how well they were done, and how some of the claims by um, some of the other uh, historians who came out afterward, um, some of their backgrounds, some of their perhaps their motivations, and some of their claims. So I, I would commit that it's very long. I would commit that article to you because I think it's important that we understand what the concerns are about the 1619 project what if any were valid, and then how those were addressed. Because in journalism, see how I segue? You see how I did that? <laughs> um, in, in journalism, there is a process by which if we get something wrong, it is our duty, our obligation to correct it, right? And so at that point where, well, A, we have fact checkers, and I'm not sure why the Times did not listen to those fact checkers. She was one of them, and you know, obviously, had the Times listened to her, we could have probably avoided some of this, but I doubt we would have probably avoided all of it, right? But um, that does illustrate that, A, there are fact checkers on something like this. Obviously, not every media organization is the size of the New York Times or operates under the scope with fact checkers. I'll say that. Um, but. In that process, there were fact checkers who unfortunately were not listened to, which called for what is needed, which would be a clarification or a correction and um, a revamping of a potential piece, on, especially for the online edition that will live forever. So those are some of the corrective measures that were taken um, regarding some of what uh, some of what even Hannah Nicole uh, Jones said were some of the, um, if, and some of those concerns again were in her personal essay, right? Um, those were some of the things she did concerning the concerns that were raised that she said, yeah, some of those are valid, others are not, right? Um, and she was extraordinarily public about those. She amended those in the book as well as in the project online. And so that's the process by which we function, um, just overall as journalists. Uh, we want to get it right, obviously. We should be vigorous. We should be talking to experts, and we should certainly be heeding them when they say red flag, red flag, right? And with and when and if we don't, there is a very public process of transparency that hopefully allows us not to lose all of the credibility that a project has, right, um, when, we, and when we correct an error, which is what they did. Did that That's great. Sarah? Thank you very much. I just want to clarify. It's actually it's Nicole Hannah Jones. I'm sorry. What did I say? No. Yeah. We, we both we we've all been sort of flipping it. Yeah. Oh, okay. I can't have any kids too, so they don't have that problem also. But, I just, <laughs> <laughs> but yes. Okay, Heather. What benefit yes. can a narrative like the 1619 Project bring to the classroom? What are the possible consequences? Okay. Repeat that for me. Sure. What benefit can a narrative like the 1619 Project bring to the classroom? Well, it's a more complete representation of history. And again, one of the things that we've done is that we've taught slavery, we, slavery we've taught racism as um, black history. And it needs to be taught as American history. And so bringing a project like the 1619 um, project in would allow us a fuller expectation, you know, a fuller understanding of history because you know there was there was more to George Washington. There was more to Thomas Jefferson, um, and and it it allows us to pair what we traditionally teach with um, opposing. Well, I don't want to say opposing view, viewpoints, but fuller mm -hmm. accountings of what happened. Um, many of you probably are sitting in here and you've never heard of um, the Red Summer of 1919. Mm -hmm. Right? How many have heard of that? Just raise your hand. Oh, look. Like three, four. When did um, they Red Summer of 1919 uh, was a summer of basically what they call race riots, but it was, it was a summer where um, actually kind of months where um, there were a number of racialized terror visited upon black communities um, in various areas of the country. It began in Chicago, where um, a young boy made the mistake of um, swimming onto the white side of the beach in Chicago and was subsequently pulled from the water and beaten to death. 
And so that started a series of, um, you know, they like to call it riots, but protests around the country that resulted in de hundreds of deaths of African Americans. Why don't we learn about that? Well, we learn about that because we're learning about um, what? Susan B. Anthony, you know, leading marches because that, you know, um, glorifies American history. Mm -hmm. um, but, the, but the reality is this, James Baldwin, one of my favorite um, quotes by him is, I love America more than any other country in this world. And for that reason, I reserve the right to criticize her perpetually. Mm -hmm. And so we just get to the point where we allow students to think critically about our country. We allow students to um, think critically about the events of it and then also about how um, that history continues to impact us so that in the end we do have a better understanding moving forward. And we have, um, I think one of the, the other really great impacts of it is that we're creating culturally competent children. All right, most of the racism, I tell people this all the time, most of the racism that I experience will not be from bad people. It will not even be intentional, mm -hmm. okay? But that's because we have created adults that are not culturally competent. And so at times understand how their experience, their behavior, and negatively impacts me um, in certain ways. Well, that's just some out. And it's not a point of anger, it's getting people to um, provide them with the skills to be able to discuss these things. And so that's what bringing in the 1619 Project and bringing in culture and bringing in, you know, DEI, all of that, that's what it does. It creates people that are culturally competent. And DEI is? <laughs> Diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you. OK, so we're going to move on to talking about anti-CRT legislation impact on education curriculum. So anti-CRT legislation yes. and how it might affect education curriculum. So this is a question for all the panel. The Missouri Council of History Educators claims that the passage of a legislative bill similar to House Bill 932 or of House Bill 1141 from the 2021 session would eliminate a significant number of historical topics from the classroom curriculum and discussions. For example, Amendment 3 of House Bill 1141 states that curriculum implementing critical race theory shall include any curriculum that identifies people, entities, or institutions as racist, biased, privileged, or oppressed, and two, employs immutable, inherited, or objective characteristics such as race, income, appearance, family of origin, or sexual orientation in the service of classifying persons into groups for any purpose. If a similar bill were to pass, how would the historical topics such as the Dred Scott case, slavery, the Civil War, the Depression, women's suffrage or the civil rights movement be taught in Missouri classrooms? That's a big question. It couldn't be. <laughs> yeah, it couldn't be. Not, um, not with any type of verity. It could not be. Um, for instance, Red Scott decision, Supreme Court Justice Taney stated that the black man has no rights that the white man was bound to respect. I couldn't even read that because that statement would be identifying groups. Right. And I couldn't have my students then examine how that continues to impact us when we think in terms of Karens. Because basically what that, you know, partially led to is a culture where, um, you know, a, a, the governance of black bodies in our society and so we just get to the point where we, can't, we couldn't talk about the Holocaust um, with any type of verity because we couldn't name Jews. We couldn't name the, the historical groups that were you know, discriminated against. 11 million people died and we wouldn't even be able to say why they died. 
um, and or the name it as institutional. Mm -hmm. um, and so we get to the point where what this is doing, and, I, and this is the biggest thing that I have a problem with, is that it is um, it is prioritizing white comfort over minority truths. And as I as I have stated, you know, I, I tell this story all the time. The first time I was called the N word, I was in second grade. Um, I had teachers and administrators that were not culturally competent, and so as a result, only thing I remember from second grade is being called the N-word. My daughter, my beautiful baby back there, um, she was in fifth grade. Her experience was much different than mine because she did have teachers and administrators that were culturally competent. They did not deal with it by removing her from the classroom as if she was the one that, that committed some type of wrong. Um, and they dealt with it in a way that was so, um, like I said, culturally competent, on top of it, um, understanding of, of what was happening, that her memories of fifth grade are not filled with that trauma. Her memories of fifth grade are actually filled with, um, you know, her fifth grade teacher, Mr. Yowitz. I still love Mr. Yowitz. Asking her to love math and science and reading and all of these great things. And so we just get to the point where we, we're becoming comfortable and the idea behind all of this is comfort in black trauma. Mm -hmm. Comfort in, in, you know, our black students um, and, and students of color being left behind and that being okay because at least there's not a child, a white child out there that was discomforted by having to learn about racism, xenophobia, by having to learn about, um, you know, homophobia and transphobia, et cetera, et cetera. And that's not something that I personally could accept as a teacher. I had a moral obligation to all of my students, to love all of my babies. And to this day, anyone that is on my Facebook page for any length of time sees I still have relationships with my kids. I, I've been blessed to um, perform weddings for some of them, you know, to marry them, to be there, to see their babies, uh, et cetera. And those are kids of all races because our, our obligation to teach all of our kids. And sometimes that means discomfort. Um, for some, so I think I got away from the topic. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Mitchell, I have a question related to anti-CRT legislation. Okay. Do you want to add on to that? I, I do want to add on yeah. to that, and, and I actually want to reframe the question. Well, not reframe it, but just sort of say the following. If you are white in America, do you know your ethnic ancestry? Where are you from? The country, maybe the city, your ethnic background. Consider the following. Would you ever have a history class that didn't talk about your ancestors who were Irish, or who were German, or who were English, or French? Would you ever have a class that denied you the opportunity to engage with the way in which those ancestors were treated when they arrived on American shores? And their exclusion, the ethnic ghettos that they were placed in, their relationships. Would you ever have that to be excluded as a part of an American history class? You wouldn't. Because that's what we claim as the fabric, right? The melting pot, the great melting pot, which is actually not really a melting pot. Some call it a salad. We call it a, a quilt. However you want to call it. Would that mean that, in effect, we should remove St. Patrick's Day celebrations? How about Oktoberfest? How about those celebrations? We permit those because those ethnic groups were allowed to forget their ethnic background and fall under an umbrella of whiteness. But the genesis of that, when they first did too. Now, the difference is, and this is the importance of critical race theory is, they were not property. They were not bought and sold, raped and tortured and humiliated and mutilated. There's the difference. You cannot conflate those experiences or ignore them. They are valued experiences, right? If we allow this legislation to pass, 
We don't talk about Sally Hemings. We talk about the great principal, Thomas Jefferson. Right? We don't talk about the fact that, and, and this is the one I, I love the most, is there's some reason that says that you cannot be patriotic and still be critical. That you cannot be a part of this society and be critical of it. It's not mutually exclusive. The fact is, and we, see, and we have seen this through history, the Harlem Hellfighters who fought Nazism and fascism abroad came back to be segregated in their own country. They died for a principle that they could not actually live. Native American wind talkers removed, ancestors removed, they contributed to American success on the battlefield. If that's not true love of your country, I don't know what is. That you can pick up a weapon and fight for the principles of a country that denies you that opportunity. That's what critical race theory does. And that's what the legislation will, in effect, ban students from learning. The ability to say this country is filled with hypocrisy, but no nation is not, is, 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 isn't filled with hypocrisy. That's the point. It's not, this is not Camelot, the shining castle on the hill that is devoid of any kind of moral failings. Right? The other argument that I, that I find really flawed is when we say, let's not judge our founding fathers too harshly because they were men of their time. There were also men of that same time who were abolitionists. We don't talk about them. We don't hear them because we want to elevate the myth, the story of these principled individuals. And we call them founding fathers, but let's be real. There were founding mothers in there too. But, right? but that's a gendered analysis, right? That would be radical feminism saying, listen, who's absent from the story? And how can you talk history and founding without a critical race theory lens when you just look at the mosaic in the picture that shows who sat at the Constitutional Convention? You can't have a conversation. Everybody in that room was white. Everybody in that room was male and were propertied. Let's also throw that in there too, because that was this class dynamic that we don't talk about. That's the differential between power and economics. We don't talk about that, right? The flashpoint now has been race because race is consistently the flashpoint. And quite well, honestly, and I'm sorry, I'll let you get the question in a second, is that there is the great underlying fear. And we saw the fear and it was truly manifested when Barack Obama was elected. The first black president gets elected and people said, oh my God, the recriminations are gonna come and they're gonna come hard and fast because we recognize how we have disabused this entire group. And oh my goodness, this is time for payback. That was the fear. That was the grand fear that never materialized, right? The same thing happened in South Africa. The grand fear that the majority that had been mistreated was somehow going to engage in a killing spree of all these people, that didn't happen. They, however, had a Truth and Reconciliation Committee to recognize the fact that they had mistreated their citizens of color. We have never sat down and done that. We have done it sporadically. We did it with those who were uh, with the Japanese, the Japanese internment, for the property that we stole from them, right? We have done it with respect to Native Americans, and we have tried, and not successfully. What have we done for its black citizens? We've looked back and said, get over it. The time has passed. Move past it. Racism no longer exists. The legacy of racism, that long shadow, is still being cast. Can I add just one thing? And, and listen, the other day for my organization, we went through and we looked at the pre-filings. I looked at the pre-filings. Which one? Following, OK? And so for. Um, the Missouri legislature, this, this gotcha. okay. return. Um, these bills are back, okay? So yes, last time we were able to push it back, these bills are back. And they are labeling it um, discrimination in education. Parents, the amazing part about the Parent Bill of Rights is that it's all rights that parents already have, okay? But what they did is they stuck the part in about ERT that they removed a right from black parents because that's the other part. I pay taxes too. And 
if we're going to go through and we're going to say what books I don't want kid, you know, we don't want our kids to read, if we're going to say what, um, you know, what we should be able to do as far as having control over our children's education, et cetera, et cetera, then, then let's do this. You might not like my answer, but if we're going to have a parent's bill of rights, then let's have all the parents have rights mm -hmm. because we pay taxes too. And that ends up being one of the biggest arguments made. Well, taxpayers should have the right. No, what you're trying to say is that you want to remove from schools the ability to teach all children. You want to make schools, um, you know, right now we are, we're in a process of decolon decolonizing our schools, <clears throat> trying to in certain ways. And what they want to do is to say, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> No, 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 we actually want our kids to learn about black people. We don't actually want our kids to learn about anything that's gonna make them uncomfortable, but that's exactly what they're doing and in the process, they're removing rights from black and brown parents. They're removing rights from basically any parents that they disagree with, you know? And the hard part is that they're doing it in a way to make sure that, you know, their opinions count but ours don't. And so please look, I, I looked, there were probably at least 20 bills that we're going to be following for the Missouri Equity Education Partnership or MOE, um, because all of them in some way contain some of this language to ban CRT. Well, what they're trying to ban is diversity, equity, and inclusion, training and development. There was even a bill in there that would ban school districts from providing diversity, equity, and inclusion training to their teachers. So that their teachers are prepared to teach diverse groups of children. So please be on the lookout and please make sure that you are supporting, that you're using your voice, that you, um, you know, are following organizations like ours that are going to be openly fighting against this, that you are um, uh, making sure that, that your friends and family members understand the significance of this as well. One, another thing that we fail to do a lot of times is talk about how racism negatively impacts white people too. Do you know how many economic opportunities we've missed? One of the reasons why St. Louis was unable to get the um, Amazon headquarters was because of our educational systems. Our school districts were so segregated and so blatantly um, disadvantaged, you know, unlevel, that Amazon said they couldn't be guaranteed an educated workforce. So that's how it, there is a school district down in Southern Missouri right now that cannot find a Spanish teacher. Because children, basically that, that, that particular um, area is racist. Mm -hmm. People experience so much racism, they can't get a Spanish teacher to move down there and teach their children Spanish, the second most spec spoken language in the world. So that's the other thing that we need to change about, uh, about these narratives is that this isn't a, a you know, a Native American problem. This is an us problem, it's all of us. We're all negatively impacted by this. And so please, please, please be on the lookout for some of these laws and don't be fooled by the language in them too. Again, they're, they're, they're trying to codify discrimination and naming it um, discrimination in education mm -hmm. as if they're against it. So, okay, I'm done. Yeah, that Okay, so we're going to switch one question about the media's role in this conversation, and then I'm going to open it up to see if we have questions from the audience. Okay. So, Ruby. Yes? Whether we agree or disagree with what is printed on the paper or on our nightly news, the media and the language they use are a big part of everyone's life. Do you feel the media has a responsibility to report on issues like critical race theory with an intention towards educating the public, and how does the public hold the media accountable to not fanning the flames when divisive issues like this appear in headlines? Okay, um, so the answer to part to question number one is yes. <laughs> um, we do. Uh, and it's actually where we should shop. 
So I think in terms of explaining um, issues like this. So you should not be surprised, for example, about all the things that you hear that are going on in the legislature. Um, you should not be surprised by those things. It's, it's our job to tell you what's going on, right? It's also our job to ask critical questions of the legislature um, and to ask them, well, what exactly then, if they're not teaching this, what should our history teachers then teaching? Like, say your bill, Senator, you know, representative or whomever, or Senator whomever, is successful and it passes, what's left? Like, show me, walk me through, right? And, and by the way, do you have a background in curriculum? I'm just asking because I would really like, right? We're, it's our job to be, to be critical thinkers and to ask critical questions, right? Um, when we don't, so when I read this as a journalist and just as a human being, but when I read this, I go, okay, well, the, we should not teach any curriculum that identifies people in these or institutions as racist biased, privileged. There being some assumptions made about people groups. Um, and, and, we're, and we're actually saying, okay, well, people, there were, there were never any oppressed people ever, sir? Is that, is that what your people were, there were never? I mean, what, what part of history here are you revising or omitting? And to what harm to our democracy, which I'm sure you're really trying in some way to protect? Now, some people will say, well, that's not a journalist's role. A journalist is supposed to be, obje I don't want to talk about objectivity. We can talk about that all day. But part of the role of a journalist, as far as I'm concerned, um, is to ask questions that parents, if, if, if I'm at the table, around a bunch of educators or a bunch of voters, right, that voters or parents would want asked. I'm in the room for a reason, right? And so I'm really trying to understand to what it, this, whatever it is, will be, right? So it is my job to, A, make sure that I am comfortable enough and I've dealt enough with my own biases that apparently according to this don't exist but all right right so I <laughs> I need to deal with those right first before I can ask really open intellectually curious questions I might already know that this such and such is really just a bigot but I'm gonna play this out like they're not okay because that's part of my role It's part of my role to say to give somebody somewhat of a benefit of a doubt and say perhaps you really don't know how ignorant and racist this is i'm just going to give you that benefit of the doubt and i'm just going to ask you some questions and see if you we can get to an understanding so part of our job is to do just that is to be to be as intellectually curious is to have done the background and the research is so a lot of it ourselves to ask extraordinarily smart people like the folks on our panel and if we don't know what questions to ask ask them well when you see this what do you think I'm, I'm going to go down and talk to the you know to some folks in the legislature what should I ask them because if you don't know you don't know right and they should they could probably give you some questions to ask you should be asking parents we should, as journalists we should be asking parents what do you want us to ask about this or if we are parents, right, or as if, especially because, you know, we've got Mizzou and we are a teaching institution, right, if, if, we're, if they're young journalists, what did you learn in school, right, and if, especially if you're local, if you, what did you learn about history and how is that impacting your ability now to do your job, right, as a journalist? We, we can bring those things to our, you know, that intellectual curiosity, our personal experiences to a degree into the framework of how we investigate and ask questions, as long as we're dealing with our own biases, which apparently don't exist. And I, I'm just going to keep going there because I find that hilarious. Um, but and, I, and to make sure that I stay to the point of the questions, because I, I will banter on hold us accountable in multiple ways um and and I, um i say this with the caveat that we ain't gonna necessarily always like it but hold us accountable anyway right <laughs> um read well i would also obviously i first would say subscribe but if you want us to survive and be able to do our jobs correctly we need we need to hire good people to do them subscribe right um so that we can be able to do that secondarily i would say um, and equally as important, I shouldn't say it's secondary, they're, they're probably equal, um, read. And read and say, you know, I really wanted to know, like I can't even find out on the website what my sixth grader is learning. Why can't you find me what my sixth grader is learning in history? I'd really like to know, 
We certainly can, right? If you have a, you know, reach out to us, whether it's online or, you know, via email or what have you. Uh, if it's, you know, if it's on social media, um, reach out to us, ask us questions, challenge us as to, uh, Tracy Wilson Kleekamp is not here, and I don't know how many of you know her, but Tracy has no problem <laughs> coming to us going, you know, that was pathetic. <laughs> you know, you should have done it. I cannot believe, Ruby, what are you teaching them back when I was at Missouri? What are y'all teaching them kids? I, they were, she was involved to the point where um, her, her, her perspective was appreciated and she was able to bring change to coverage. Now you may say, I don't have time for that. If you do nothing else, write a letter to the editor. I say that as now as an op-ed editor, so I'm always like, write an op-ed. <laughs> um, really, write, 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 you know, go to the meetings and, and address your Congress, address your, um, your legislators and find a media person and say, is there me? Ask what media person, you know, talk to your local media outlets, who's coming to cover this? What do you mean y'all not coming? Right? Make sure that we are, that, that we are, um, we understand that you care, um, even though we do, and sometimes we don't know about every single thing. So if there's an event you want to make sure we know about it, don't hesitate. Reach out to us. Um, ask us why we're not in the public sphere more. D talk to us, right? Um, that would be the, the main thing I would say. Um, if, if, it is, you know, if you want us to, to cover things more robustly, but also um, as far as our young journalists are concerned, answer their questions when they call y'all. How about that? Okay, and I said it as the former editor of the Columbia Missourian, stop ghosting my babies. Answer their questions. Um, and also, if we say, if we tell you guys, well, we can't get, you know, Chuck Basie, who's kind enough to show up at school board meetings and blather, but we can't get him to go on the record. If you voted for or against Chuck Basie or you were in his district, call his office and say, why are you not talking? I saw in the media, it said no comment today because we usually will say repeated attempts to reach whoever were not, you know, were, were not, uh, were not successful. How come you're not talking to them? We want to know what you think we, we want, and we want you to say it in public. That is another way that you can, you know, that you can make sure that your voices are heard in, in partnership with the media. Did I answer that question? That's great, Ruby. Oh, great. Can Thank I you so much. <laughs> <laughs> But, oh, and I will also say, if there's a headline or something that you, that you disagree with, especially, you know, um, please don't hesitate to call us, reach out to us. In, any media outlet worth its salt is going to do two things. They're going to hear you out. And especially if it's something online, and, and you have, a, and we have, we explain our process and why, you know, how this might work, whatever. But if there's something that's offensive, that's inaccurate, God forbid, please tell us, right? Even if you post on Facebook, that suck. That's not even accurate. That's we might miss that. Please email the editor or whatever, an editor or um, the, whatever the email address is, and let them know there's a problem with this. And immediately we should respond to you and say thank you so much. We're on it, and you should see change in the you know on the next you know whenever we uh, even pretty much pretty quickly when we update online even if it's too late for us in print then we run a correction or clarification and that's that process hold us to it hold us to it okay, okay thank you <laughs> so we're gonna shift to um, questions from the audience and we're gonna switch back and forth between questions from the audience who are present and then questions from the audience online so do we have questions So, you okay? you, yeah. do we have any questions on the cards? Not yet? Okay. There's a question. There and I will say, if there is a reporter from the Columbia, Missouri in here, I'm sure you have a question. <laughs> okay. I'll find, I will find out who show Even though I don't work here anymore, I know there's a J school student in here with a question. <laughs> So I had a quick question, which just has to do with, we see a lot of stuff where folks want to say, like, you can't teach 1619, right? Or you can't teach certain things. And wondering if you could clarify the understanding that I have anyway of the 1619 project as a collection of primary sources that might be available to use in other curriculums versus the actual set curriculum, right, which would be something different, someone teaching, and, and what does that difference look like, and how might that play into maybe the way things are being phrased in some of the legislation? So what Nicole Hannah-Jones
Jones, <laughs> Nicole Hannah Jones um, did was that, yes, yeah, she did put together a, a wonderful collection of primary sources. Um, and then, but they, they also went through and they, they did lesson plans um, that teachers could readily use in their um, lesson and teaching of these various concepts. But one of the things that we have to really, really realize is that a lot of this legislation is um, disingenuous. It is in, in place in order to rile people up. And so when it says the 1619 project, that's, it's not clear what they're really talking about. Um, are you talking about, it, I can't get primary sources from this collection, or are you talking about I can't use the, oh, yeah, the, um, the online the lessons that, and okay. suggested lessons that they put together from this? So we don't know. Um, that's the bottom line. We don't know. I think that um, we just have to remember that this is, this is just one tool that they're using in order to ban diversity, equity, and inclusion training or, or teaching in general, because they also, I believe in there, they also said anything from teaching tolerance, anything from We Stories, which I took personal offense to because I partner with We Stories. Um, I partner with their current director in order to provide um, a, a webinar on raising anti-racist children. And so all of this is, is, we don't know. I don't know what they're trying to ban. They're just putting some stuff down on paper that might inflame people. And so, like for instance, they, they used the, to be antithetical to the 1619 project, they created the 1776 project. Um, they, they put it on the website like days before uh, the inauguration and it basically was a very um, glorified history of America that was um, very much whitewashing it and leaving out essential players within it, especially if those people were um, people of color, um, so LGBTQ, regular history, et cetera. The way they always have talked. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. <laughs> but they that but they put that so, you know, once the new president came in, they took that down. Um, and and it was what was the whole point of that? Well the whole point of that again is that we're putting um, it it's to be divisive, um, and to put um, and to pit pro Pro DEI people against, you know, anti DEI people. So I, I don't know exactly what they're banning. They just said, if you look at the legislation, it just says 1619 project. Okay, uh, the first question we received is, uh, will there be a rebuttal to Dr. Mich Mitchell and the panelists' responses? And as a member of the planning committee, I think Ruby alluded to the answer. We asked a number of anti-CRT activists to participate on this panel and they declined to join this panel this morning. Uh, the the questioner also suggested someone that we might contact and consider in the in the future. Well, here are the critiques. Use of parables and stories are viewed as problematic because they can be employed to mislead. Race crits, CRT folks are too negative, and the despairing images of racial progress and regress offers little hope. Other critiques are that CRT plays fast and loose with the truth and the race card is played at trial, such as, uh, for example, O.J. Simpson, and yet most recently we see at Armand Arbery that it was not a false notion that it's played at trials, that it was used there by defense and defense counsel. We see the backlash in July of 2020 with Christopher Rufo, the activist who wrote for the Manhattan Institute, saying that it was, a, which is a conservative think tank, who published the article saying that Seattle City employees had been subjected to what he called whites only training that was inducting them into the cult of critical race theory because it sought to address issues around diversity, equity, and inclusion. To the person who asked the question, I have no problem engaging with, criti with critics or engaging in critiques because quite honestly, that's only how we have civic dialogue and we move 
free. Does it go too far? Does it go far enough? What are the true tenets? Are they actually engaging it? And quite honestly, if we had those conversations, we'd be able to address some more pertinent issues as opposed to critical race theory, such as how do we do shootings? And I would, if I may add to that, I think as um, as journalists, I, we would, I would, as a journalist, I would welcome having a conversation uh, with someone who is saying there are certain things I want my child to learn, there are certain things I don't, so that we can hash out um, what those things might be. So, do you have a problem? You don't have a problem with uh, what, right? Or you do have a problem with what exactly? Uh, I'm a grandparent of three students or of three children. My oldest granddaughter. There are things about. Um, history, the history of this country and violence towards, whether it's violence towards women in this country or violence towards um, enslaved Africans in this country or violence towards black people in this country that I think for her are um, not appropriate for her to see visually. So pictures of people being lynched. I don't want, I don't want, I would not want, neither would my, my son or his wife want us to be surprised by um, a lesson on lynching at her grade level. She's in the sixth grade, right? I don't think any parent wants to be surprised about something like that. That's not a that's not a race issue necessarily. That's an appropriateness of a particular topic. But let's talk about what 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 is appropriate, what's not. Let's talk. I would love to know what people who who are against understanding um, issues of race, class, and culture, or understanding issues of um, of slavery and oppression and those things. What it is that you don't want your children to know. Um, I would also want to say to them, um, understand this, whether it's taught in schools or whether you are teaching it in your home, if you come up to my grandchildren with something on the playground or in the cafeteria, you will get a, they, your child will, will get a lesson that's not in the books. So if you don't want them to, because we teach them how to answer certain questions and how to deal with certain nonsense, because they won't deal with it the way I was taught to deal with it. They won't deal with it the way my parents were taught to deal with it. They will not accept on their, on, on their little backs that they have to make other people comfortable, that they have to accept being called something or being treated a certain way because little Johnny didn't understand. Little Johnny better get a clue. That's just me personally. That has nothing to do with where I work. That is me personally <laughs> as a grandmother. I'm done with waiting for people to decide whether they're going to deal with this either in their schools or within their homes. Let any one of anybody's children come up to one of my grandbabies in school. I will say this again, make sure everybody gets it clearly. <laughs> in school, and, and if they don't understand what not to call somebody, they will learn it from one of my three, guaranteed. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I will just respond like this. Um, I am always willing to engage with people who are ready to learn, but there's no way, unfortunately, that you are going to sit with me and convince me that my history, my experience, should not be taught in schools. So if you want to learn more about my history, how I would teach it, et cetera, et cetera, yes, by all means, let's, we can have that conversation. But you're not going to tell me that somehow your child will be physically, mentally, and emotionally damaged by learning about racism when my child is still experiencing it. There's just not. And so yes, I do believe in having conversation and, and genuine dialogue around these issues, as long as we come into it with a few different understandings. Um, and, and the same thing, okay? Um, my baby back there, any of my kids, they are ready to explain to you why it's important to them and why it's much needed um, to them. Because, you know, it's, it's small things that people don't understand. For a while there, my daughter would, didn't even want to change her hairstyles too much or like wear her hair down or anything like that because of all the kids that would come up and pet her. What, why aren't you teaching your kids not to pet people? <laughs> why? You know, it's small microaggressions. It's those things that we learn about. And if you 
really honestly, like I could parade a group of kids in front of you that not only were they not harmed by having to learn about me and, and people who look like me, they are actually in a better position because they did, because they can go into um, diverse situations and work with different types of people with the understanding of equality and equity with the understanding that not everyone has the same experience as you, and that's okay. But that sometimes we have to problem solve to find out where we differ, and then also we have to, to learn from one another to find out where we're the same. And I just, I, I have a hard time debating whether or not we should be doing that. So yes, I am happy to sit down with anyone that is anti-CRT, as long as, again, the understanding is that you're not going to convince me that um, you shouldn't be learning about me. history? And are those teachers that have this history extracted from their, I mean, who's going to enforce this? And when they try to enforce this, what's going to happen? I think the people who are promoting um, taking history out of history, real American history out of history, are actually, if we look at them closely, we don't have to look very far either, we're gonna see that they are people that, uh, that want a voucher system in place. Yes. And that want to destroy the public education system That's as it is, doing. which is also very detrimental to people of color, to all cultures, and to people, like you say, ultimately to all Americans. Yes. Yes. And so, so I, I, I wonder if you have any more to say on this topic um, on a deeper level, because I, I think... Well, <laughs> yeah. well, let me just say this. Um, on August 23rd, I actually went and I, I testified before the Joint Committee um, on Education at a hearing. And after I said my little speech, et cetera, I began to engage with questions asked of me. And it became very clear then that yes, that's exactly what this is about. This is about the voucher system. Most of that, that the, the question and answer period directed towards me was solely about that. And as I stated then, there's a few problems that I have with this conversation, again, I have a problem with how they portray public school teachers. I know so many and have taught so many public school teachers. And in the end, they care about their kids. They want to do what's best for their children. And I think the biggest problem I had is how this whole thing attacks their integrity. You know, one of the first things that we are taught is about the fact that we have to make sure that we teach from as much as possible from a very um, neutral position as far as, as politics are concerned. And yet you have people that are politicizing each and every aspect of what we do. That's number one. Number two, these individuals, what they're doing is they're, they're, it's a an attempt to make people tired. Honestly, to make people tired. And so, you have school boards being attacked, school board members being attacked. That is a voluntary position that people take on because they care about our kids. And in this whole conversation, I have a friend, Chloe, that did a, a thing and she said, our kids right now are watching their villages burn because we want to um, implement a voucher system. Do you know how detrimental a voucher system will also be to um, and take money away from rural schools? In rural Missouri, guess what they don't have? They don't have charter schools and they don't have um, and they don't have private schools too often. They have their community and neighborhood schools. So if we're taking money 
away from these schools. We're leaving them all. We're already in the state of Missouri 49th as far as school funding is concerned. 49th. And yet we want to take more money away from, and here's the, the real kick. From my understanding, um, if they implement the voucher system as they have it, you know, written right now, each person would be able to get like 6,300, 6,500, something like that dollars, over $6,000 less than 7,000. I'm from St. Louis. There is almost no public school, excuse me, private school in St. Louis that you can go to for six, $7,000 a year. So who is this gonna benefit? It's not gonna benefit you know, people on a, a lower income scale because they would still have another 20,000 or so dollars to make up for. They don't have that. So this, this whole, again, this whole thing seems to be very disingenuous. If they could turn um, their voting base against public schools, public school teachers, then it would be easy to go ahead and say, you know what, here's a solution. We already have a solution for you without individuals realizing how very detrimental that solution would be. So yes, very good question. It, it, to, I would also have a question though uh, that that it, this raises for me do with what's really in the history books our kids are using anyway. Um, I've, I've, I've only seen a few studies or whatnot and some random kind of things about what information is already in um, and how complete, uh, how incomplete rather that that the history that our children are learning is already. So maybe they wouldn't they really have to do much. But <laughs> <laughs> um, uh -huh. They wouldn't have to do much at all, well, uh, I mean, and then they could just ban, and not just sixteen nineteen, but they could they would simply, I guess, ban other books that come in to supplement that. that I'm I'm asking the question because I don't know, but I, I think that's a very interesting thought to pursue. But I think I mean I think we've seen that already, right? So Texas mm -hmm. already did that at the state level. They already had a committee that revised their history textbooks already that softened the, con right? So it was, the language wasn't, these were slaves who were brought over as property. These were- Indigent servants. Thank you, yeah, it was like, yes. The, oh no, no, no they, they went softer than that. They called them like laborers, forced laborers mm -hmm. or laborers. It was, a, it was a way that basically, it wasn't even about slavery, it was about these individuals had this choice to get on that first boat for some reason, yeah, right? And so yeah, and so it wasn't, it wasn't even, so they've done that already, right? We've seen that. And now the changing in school boards, now that becomes the next step, right? I mean, the, the, the problem that I, with this convert, with, with the issue about mining textbooks and what have you, is the following. The, the, the buzzwords are that somehow the teaching about slavery and America's real history creates white guilt and white guilt about the past. And it makes white people feel, oh my God, you're making me really feel bad about my ancestors or about who I am, right? So unpacking that is the following. The first thing is this, we all benefit from some kind of privilege. Let's just be honest. As a male, I have some kind of privilege in society. Right? I can walk to my car in the middle of the night. I'm privileged in that sense. I feel rather secure in this context, right? As someone who's heterosexual, I, there are some other privileges, particularly pre Obervel, right? Before same sex marriage, there was a, a privilege that associated there, right? With, with, with that particular issue, right? There are privileges that we have across, right? Race, however, is one that we see, it's quite visible, it's, it's present, it's apparent, that can strip away a whole lot of other privileges in one fell swoop, and we've seen that happen, right? So that's sort of one, one of the things that we sort of need to sort of actually engage in, right? The other piece has become, it's just about this, it's about the language, and quite honestly, CRT is the next step, right, about how we're trying to control or redefine schools, right? If you go back to the transgender movement, right, in schools, that becomes the first, that that was the first flashpoint, right, before this became the next flashpoint, right? And so now we're moving along different flashpoints that we deem to be important pieces of culture here that we are fighting against, right? And this becomes now the issue. The last thing I would say is the following. No one had a problem with black children guilt. I still don't. Right? I still don't. So, so, and so here's the thing, right? So when we looked at history books, what did we see? We saw slavery. We saw civil rights. We saw it's over. Things about Kush kingdoms, right? African Americans, Africans, our ancestors creating science and math and history and art. That was gone. So it wasn't included in part of the history that we under that we sort of undertook, right? The, the inventors, African American inventors. Well, who learns about that in 
K through 12 schools, right? Those things are absent from the curriculum, solely absent, right? Because the narrative has to, is very clear. We save these savages from the lands of Africa, we Christianized them, and we made them civilized. That's the narrative, right? And in order for that narrative to work and for it to be applied in the United States, you have to dismiss all the other contributions, all the other benefits, and anything of positive value, right? That's not CRT. That's history, world history and American history. But we can't have that, right? And the last thing I'd say is this, and we've done this with the Horatio Alger myth, right? Pull myself up on my bootstraps, really? Really? Oil barons, the, the, the ancestors of oil barons pulled themselves by, the, by their bootstraps? I don't think so, right? The generational wealth that gets passed on down there is the same thing, and that's, that's what's most concerning, is that what we have engaged in with respect to CRT, or not even CRT, learning about our history is, it's a cognitive dissonance. No one wants to feel as though they didn't earn what they have. And the cognitive distance is, oh, you mean to tell me I benefited from 400 years of free labor from somebody else? And this is, this is not a problem? This is, the, this is the issue, right? The last piece I would say is that is, and this is the problem, is those who occupy that strata of lower SES white America, who feel as though CRT or this teaching is somehow problematic, don't recognize the fact of how race played a role in their status in American society from the outset. Property to individuals who owned farms and plantations with hundreds of slaves said, yeah, one day you can be like us, but for now, you just get to be the lower classes and control these black folks. But one day you can rise up. This is that whole, what's it, Joe the Plumber guy. That one day I'm gonna hit it rich, I'll be a millionaire, right? That's gonna be, that's gonna be the escape hatch. The escape hatch was this, this is, and this is the birth of, of white supremacy, saying fundamentally, guess what? Hey, you may not be as rich as us, but at least you ain't black in America. Right. Right? At least you're not on the lowest rung. And one day you might be able to sort of escape your class background if you align yourself with us. That's what sort of we teach, or that's what we should be teaching. I teach it as a law professor. I can talk about it in the legal context because it's far more complex. I can talk about the structures, the system, the Fugitive Slave Act, the act that allowed them to raise a defense in the Arbery trial of a citizen's arrest which was born pre-Civil War. That systemic racism right there born of a Fugitive Slave Act and being able to have posses of white people go out and chase black people who were running away for their own humanity. That's CRT. That's not taught. I didn't learn that in high school. We don't teach that in high school. And that is far too deep a concept. But it's the beginning of conversations. I would like to add one thing to what you just said. If you want to know more about that, there's a book by Resma Manicum called My Grandmother's Hands, which speaks about that exact topic right. and how that experience affects our bodies and how our bodies respond to people of color as a result of that. So I just want to put that out there. It's called My Grandmother's Hands. Take another Zoom question. Okay, the next question is, can white people escape being racist? According to, Delg to Delgado and Stefancic, the answer is no. They say whites are incapable of righteous action on race because if, as Dr. Mitchell explained, whites are Whites, whites and not just elites are doing it as a benefit to themselves. Hmm. I don't know. I feel I, I, I've heard that, that theory. Um, I don't quite teach that. What I teach, though, is that everyone has a responsibility to be anti-racist. Um, everyone has a responsibility to continue to learn as we go. We have to realize the ways that we are enculturated into American racism. Um, and so I don't honestly go around calling people uh, a racist because it's such a, a, it's such a loaded word when what I need from people um, 
it, it's, it's to try every single day, um, even when you mess up. And we have to realize that again, like, like, um, oh my gosh, Dr. David. Mitchell, thank you, Dr. <laughs> Mitchell. I was like having a moment. Um, as Dr. Mitchell talked about, um, we all have some type of privilege. And so we have ways that we have to work on um, making sure that we are more inclusive. And so like for me, I have Christian privilege. I have to work on consistently ways of making sure that my language and my behavior is not putting forth Christian supremacy and that I am being inclusive of other belief systems, including atheism, if people don't believe. How, am, how are my actions then um, othering these people? And I, so I think that that ends up being what we need to do and what we need to concentrate on is, is not, um, you know, you need to call a spade if somebody's race, you know, behavior is, is racist, then you can call it what it is. But more than that, we need to work on learning what it means to be anti-racist and, and learning what it means to um, work through our biases and understand how our biases impact other people. Yeah, I, I would say, uh, I hope people can change because in my house, that means I'd be living with a racist, <laughs> my spouse. I mean, so I presume that people certainly can change indeed, and that's not the case. I mean, the issue is this, is I think it's not about whether or not folks can change in this context. Um, one has to be intentional, one has to be conscious and aware of the fact of what they're engaging in and what they're doing, right? So for example, I'll tell you an example. So my, my wife, my spouse is Jewish, right? Well, I grew up in New York City. There's Jews all over New York City, right? And I was like, what are you talking about? You're killing the majority. And she was like, um, no, we're actually not, right? And because it's a matter of context and perspective, right? And you have to sort of learn, and you have to learn these things, right? You have to engage and understand that, right? And the key is, do I think folks can move past that? Yes. The difult thing is, and this is the problem, right, is understanding when your privilege may be actively or passively triggered. Right? And that's the difference, right? So active triggering of it is that you take advantage of it. You say, oh, yes, this is who I am, and, and, and that's, what, that's how it's going to be. The passive triggering of it and, and denouncing that is far more difficult, right? So it means when you go shopping in the mall, how do you prepare to go shopping in the mall? Do you put on a pair of jeans, old sweats, and just roll in? Because you know you're not going to be, no one's going to address it, right? No one's going to look at you. When I go, I think critically as to what I'm wearing, when, where, not, where am I going, who I'm going with, what stores I'm going, what I've picked up, what I've passed, right? For me, the simple act of going is a, is a rundown of how to navigate a space such that I can walk out without an interaction and potentially, given the circumstances around today, potentially with, with my life, right? That's a full-blown conversation, a self-conversation about how to navigate structures. That's a privileged conversation that most folks don't have, right? That's what the issue is. So the issue is transitioning and reckoning. And, 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 the, and, the, and the last piece I would say is this, is the more difficult piece, is in spaces in which other folks of color are not, is calling it out. That's the most difficult thing that happens. Being able to say to someone in your family or friend group or work, damn, that was racist. We might, you might want to check that. Let's have a conversation on that. That is the difficult piece, right? Because when we let it slide, then we are being racist because we are adopting it in our silence as acquiescence. I, I say that in my book. I talk about the fact that, you know, we need to where it's, where it's born, born is incubated. And so don't come down to my black space to tell me you aren't racist. Go to your, Go to your white spaces and say that you aren't racist. Um, churches. Um, the soccer, the soccer association, association the homeowners, the homeowners association. association. We go down, we go down, down a whole list of, of various, of various places, places that, that that's, that's where you address racism. racism. Um, um, you know, you, you know, know, you know, you know, you know, need to. That, 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 that's one problem, problem I have with politicians. politicians sometimes. Sometimes is that, is that when, when they're running, they're running the campaign, where they, they, they what do they do? They go to the black churches and they tell black people they're not they're not racist. No, no, go to go go to the white church and tell them. That you're, that you're not racist, racist. And, and that this is what you're, what you're going to be standing for as you as run, run. Um, um, because, because in the end, you know, we don't, I, I, don't, I don't be voting for, for uh, um, the, the lesser evil. evil. I want to start, I want start being, able, being able to vote for people, people that really are working, working um, um, for, for the good of my children. My children. My children.
um, I, um, I just wanted to wanted know what your thoughts, thoughts are on how, how we can do a better, better job as a collective as a and as a community in supporting, in supporting our, our local schools on the, on the current, current budget back there. You know, we're talking about getting, getting, getting tired. tired. I think a lot of people, a lot of people in that system are tired, tired including, including myself, myself, just being straight and transparent. And so, and so as, as a community, community how, can how can we uh, just uh, better do a better job of supporting the behind, behind the work that we're going on and, and the criticisms that we're getting? I am so glad that you asked that. Um, um, the Missouri, the Missouri Education, Education Partnership, Partnership. I, I, created I created it, it so, that we, so that we could do that, do work. that work, okay? okay. We, actually we actually now have, now have six, six different, different um, teams. teams. So we have so our marketing communication team, team. 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 We have our, we have our, our event fundraising, fundraising team. That's where we do like our, like our, our, our virtual town halls and events. Group. 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 But then we have our inter council, our business council, political action team, and the team that addresses your question, our education agency council. That the whole that point of that is that, that what we're trying to do is with every single single district in Missouri, Missouri. we want we to want have, have a Moe chapter. chapter. And, and, and that chapter, that chapter is solely there, there, there to do that, to do work, that work of supporting, of supporting our, teachers, our teachers, our administrators, our school board, our school board members, members, and to help and help pushing back. back. Because each district is something different. There are some school districts where this is not an issue at all. Um, and um, it's not an issue, issue because of the fact, fact that the, that the, the population of that school district, district approves of, of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion, inclusion training. training. And, so and so they, they don't have they a problem. Have a There's other districts, districts where, where it's, not, where a it's not a problem because they don't, because do, they don't it. do it. Okay? okay? They don't do it at all. And they're not being asked to do it by their constituents. But in those districts, you know, some of the ones that I've seen, yes, there is a healthy, healthy, Butting of butting heads. heads, and so, so in our, our what we ask is that, that, that everyone, everyone um, each school district has a district captain, district captain and, a and a team, and then that, that team is responsible for a few different things. things. Number one, leading one calls, calls to action. action. So, so doing things, things like, like if there's a particular if there's a teacher, 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 et cetera, that's under, under attack, attack, finding out finding what out the teacher needs in order to support them. Do they need emails? Do they need letters sent? What do they need? The next thing is that we support attending board meetings and. Speaking, speaking in favor, in favor of equity, equity and education, you know, equity education. education. Um, and then it's going to come down to also events. We're going to be looking at right now school board, um, you know, members and making sure that we that we see who are the school board members that do support um, equity education within our schools. And um, but giving all all people an opportunity to speak. All of our Candidates an opportunity to speak they stand as far as DEI CRT is concerned and so um, my organization yes we were set up for for just that we actually this year we just formed about six months ago but this year we have exploded to having hundreds of volunteers we continue to want to grow that we want thousands and thousands of volunteers um, and so been really cool we do have some some chapters that are more active started within their um, within their school district, and then from there we just start recruiting people because it's going to be very very important for us to use our voice. Um, there are there are more people who who um, support this than who are against it. And making sure that our voice is known collectively will be very important. So if you would like to join us, um, our website is www.missouri, spell out, spell out Missouri, missouriequity.com. While you're there, you can um, sign up for the um, newsletter and our mailing list. And then that is how we'll be distributing information about how you can really, um, you know, what you can be doing in our, your districts. Uh, I, I would simply add, just want to know who's on your school board. We've actually a school board member in the audience, if you didn't know that. Yeah, right? school so, board member. So, so, so know who is on your school board, and they are allies and advocates. Know which ones are allies and advocates uh, in that regard, number one. Um, but actually, this is far more nefarious than it was in the past, right? Mm -hmm. So this is not just about going to school boards and school boards, which are now being voted in. This is now reaching levels of state government, right? right. So when you have the attorney general who sues a school district, Right? This is no longer just a local issue. This is about sort of state takeover. And in any other time, state takeover of a local institution, people would throw their heads up and go, what, are you kidding me? This, your hands off our schools, right? But no, no, now it's fair game, apparently. But attorney general, governor, 
These are all that are concerted and, and, and very directed attacks. And there is the playbook, right? If you haven't seen the playbook on how to address this, there's a playbook that says, these are the words that you should look for in any curriculum and how to address this. And it's a yeah. list of like 100 words. A bunch of them. Diversity, tolerance, inclusion, equity, intersectionality, privilege, all of these words. And if you find these anywhere, write these letters. And the problem is that for many of us who believe that this is the right way to go, have often stayed silent. They're like, oh, my kids are getting a good education. I don't need to speak up. Things are going great. But guess what? It's in times like when, you're, when this is being challenged, when folks need to write in and go, yeah, things are doing well. Keep, do, keep on doing what you're doing. Making your voice heard, right? Being at that parent meeting. And if you can't, writing that email, writing that letter. And I know it's really difficult, right? This was the first year I think I became one of those kind of parents because I was, things are going great. But recognizing the fact that, you know what, it's not sufficient to just sit, right? That it actually has to be be not just the affirmative word or when, when things are going poorly, but when things are going well and backing people up to say, I am this unsilent majority now. And this unsilent is, is now being sort of heard, right? And it's writing those letters, going to school board meetings, making those comments, being present in places and spaces uh, in which folks are not there. And the difficulty has often been, quite honestly, right? Not seeing, often not seeing faces of color in those spaces, right? a lot of things to do, or often seeing other people say, oh, someone else is going to take care of it. The whole thing of someone else is going to take care of it. No, no, guess what? You have to take care of it. Thank you. Uh, um, we're out of time. <laughs> Damn, it's 12 o'clock already. That's good. Wow. <laughs> so we're, we're supposed to end at noon, and it's noon now. Um, I did want to just put a little... Um, one of the things that HeartSpace Clinic, which I'm the director of, has been doing in the last 18 months is providing free mental health support for teachers. Um, it's not a systemic solution, but it's a one-on-one -on -one solution. So if anybody's interested in that or knowing more about that, um, you can email me at heartspacecliniccomo.org. Um, and that's on the hand that you all have from HeartSpace Clinic. So I want to thank our panels. Members, this was a really wonderful discussion. And thanks to our audience for your participation. Um, I'd like to take one minute just to do a little bit of a settling exercise because I'm feeling a lot of my heart's racing. I feel really excited. And I'd like to just encourage all of us to stay present in our bodies as we leave here. Um, and so just, again, feel your feet on the floor. That grounds all of us, allows us to think a little clearer. If you're ever involved in a discussion where there's heatedness, a really easy way to bring yourself back into being able to think clearly is to feel your feet on the floor. I just want to put that out there. And I hope everyone has a really great weekend, and thank you for being here.